Hey folks, if you're looking for an in-depth review, you're in the right place. Especially if you're in the mood to hear about a platformer, since today's subject is Alloware Premium's action-packed adventure, They Always Run. Join me as I skulk, slice, and shoot my way through this sci-fi stab at the genre, and see if this was a title I was ultimately eager to get a hold of, or if I would have rather run the other way. I'm your host, Arlian. Let's find out together. The Fringe World can be a dangerous place, rife with smugglers, cultists, and the broken remains of the once mighty empire. For most, it makes for hard living, but for Aiden, business has never been better. After all, there's no shortage of bounties to hunt in the Fringe, and here at least he can avoid the prejudice he might otherwise receive as a mutant three-arm. And a little bit of lawfulness certainly helps in his hunt for the grim organization that had seen him hunted down and left for dead. A hunt that has him sifting through leads and making strange new allegiances, all in the hopes that he can finally get some answers. Narratively speaking, it's genuinely enjoyable and does a decent job of providing an engrossing journey for players to embark on. It's also paced fairly well, as while there are story sequences to sit through, they don't feel overly intrusive or drawn out. In fact, they manage to maintain a fine balance of the upfront elements and foreshadowing so when the eventual denouement came around, it felt immensely satisfying to see all the theory crafting I'd been making just sort of play out. And then I wound up incredibly exasperated since, well, the game ends on a cliffhanger, and I don't just mean a small one, I mean an incredibly abrupt one, which actually had me reloading my last checkpoint to do it all over again, just in case I'd accidentally glitched out the game or there was something else. And for the record, I did. I did in fact glitch it out by moving forward when the credits started to roll, but that simply meant I missed out on the post credit stinger. That's right, all the momentum that the game builds up over the course of its story just abruptly hits a brick wall, leaving me wonder if it's teasing future DLC, a sequel, or if... Alloware simply ran out of time. That doesn't detract from the fact that until that point, I found myself really fond of the journey, but it does feel like it ends before it really plays out the third act. Though, I do question the ability to make dialogue options, since upon replaying for a bit, they didn't seem to contribute to any meaningful differences. Or the fact that the game has a fondness for having dialogue occur while you're adventuring, which would occasionally lead to a messy death since you can't actually attack while you have active dialogue on the screen, which, yeah, it's it, it definitely punished me for forging ahead a little bit too earnestly. And part of that's just because They Always Run isn't exactly easy as far as action-adventure titles go, whether it's the combat itself, the platforming, or other nuances, but we'll get to those. First, I'm going to talk about the combat because you're going to be spending a lot of your time in the thick of things. And as far as the protagonist goes, combat's interesting given that there's a balance between his overall fragility and his ability to mash out deadly sweeping attacks. Quite literally button mashing at first since things start out simple, though there will be a small dabble of guard breaking enemies with your third arm if they get uppity and block or just so you can punch them into a crowd if you need a bunch of people knocked over and have some bioenergy to spare. That said, if you don't and need to gain a charge, or just want to be excessively flashy, you can just counter almost everything into the ground. It's lethally effective, energy efficient since it gains you charges back, and it just looks really cool and can work on up to three guys at once. That's not the extent of your kit though, you do gradually gain access to new gears and an associated skill tree rife with upgrades and new moves. But there's just one thing. Not only are you prevented from modifying this tree during the game's lengthy stages, the cost for later skills grows fairly prohibitively expensive, which becomes especially noticeable once you realize that They Always Run is a linear title which prevents you from backtracking and farming. Yeah, if you want to get the most out of this tree, you'll need to scour each and every stage as thoroughly as possible for loot chests and in excess of enemies to eviscerate. Which brings us to the other half of combat, namely your enemies. You'll be dealing with these guys in droves, but 
therein lies the problem, because they're not exactly the most varied bunch. That's not to say the game doesn't gradually trickle in more types over the course of the game, but it takes a bit, so a lot of the encounters feel somewhat similar, with variety coming in the form of the landscape and how many people are shooting at you while you get dogpiled. Still, while the encounters do start to run together, that doesn't prevent they always run from being harrowing. I literally can't fathom the amount of times I found myself consumed by anxiety due to just how fragile the protagonist is, and then further compounded by the limited healing. Like yes, there's semi-frequent checkpoints for you if you die in a fight or platforming mishap, but you don't heal when you revive, so it's entirely possible to be locked into encounters with a crippled amount of health. Made all the worse when you realize that recovering from that state might take a bit, given your only form of healing is a limited consumable item you MAY encounter, which you can only hold a default of one. Like, yes, you can hypothetically discover another two consumable slots by the time you finish the game, just like you can also hypothetically discover a set of cybernetic hearts that boost your maximum health if you collect three. But, uh, small problem here. All of these items are missable, which is especially painful once you realize that the game's linear nature and inability to return to earlier stages means you can permanently miss out on these increases to your survivability, essentially locking you into a hard mode of sorts if you don't scour the stages. This is part of why I alluded the difficulty can lean a bit towards unfair at times, but it's made even worse when you realize that even during a stage, it's possible to get screwed over due to how the checkpoints work. Yes, they're semi-frequent, but you know what else they are? One use. Yeah, if you want to explore and then decide to double back, none of the earlier checkpoints will work anymore, and given that there's a lot of instant death traps and deadfalls, you can find yourself stuck in rather unpleasant scenarios, both there and back, or passing points of no return and having the game autosave. Really, it's just a shame, because between these secrets and the optional bounty targets you can beat up for more money, you're given ample reason to want to explore, but the game punishes you if you miss something and decide to double back, which just feels... yeah. And while there is an option to restart a level from scratch, I'm not kidding when I say some of these stages are quite lengthy, and the fact that you're not carrying any progress back just made me feel like I was throwing my time away. The sense of time use is also why I didn't bounce to the game a second time to do a more homicidal run. Because specifically, when you encounter the game's various bosses and bounty targets, a number of them give you an opportunity to take them in dead or alive. Dead is easier, so presumably alive rewards more money, but requires you to beat up the boss with your bionic arm. Which is what I did, since I am incredibly greedy and was trying to err on the side of caution as far as narrative choices go. Unfortunately, because of how the chapters and checkpoints work, I, uh, I can't tell what repercussions are for doing the opposite, though I can imagine that at least in one case you'll likely get chewed out for bringing a certain pickpocket in dead. Just, uh, just a hunch. That's not to say I didn't have fun fighting those bosses, but I am just not feeling up to sitting through the various forced slow walk segments on a replay, or redoing that whole process of scouring the level for power-ups. So instead, let's just mosey over to the aesthetics, and I will give Aloware credit here, they always run looks fairly nice, whether it's the cinematic transitions between areas or the various stage designs. I found the game looked pretty, and I was also pretty partial to the protagonist's combat animations, especially when you got a counter off, though uh, you have a pretty big nitpick. See, when you kill the final enemy in an area, there's a slowdown effect with the camera dramatically zooming in on the enemy, including if they kill themselves away from you and you're in the middle of a platforming puzzle. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes the, the enemies get a little bit stupid if you're platforming and they try and follow you, and this just killed me a number of times and I was salty each and every time. At least my miserable deaths though were accompanied by decent stage music. In fact, I'd say it's solid throughout the experience and I found myself pleasantly surprised by the track that's set aside for the game's climatic finale, but uh, 
yeah, that's the long of my experience with They Always Run, and it was a lot. I think there was some good ideas at the heart of the game. The combat started out decent but challenging and gradually provided me with an increasing number of opportunities to do stupid things, like using a grappling hook to pull enemies into pits or set them up into horrible combo chains, but it also had infuriating decisions like its approach to expansive, exploration-oriented stages that are rife with points of no return. It was a curious decision, especially given that the overall length of the game meant it wasn't exactly an arcadey experience where you were meant to tear through it in an hour. Missing something important means your misery will compound itself over dozens of hours. And that just doesn't sit right with me, like this didn't prevent me from enjoying They Always Run. I was actually pretty satisfied by the time I got to the end, but it definitely hung at the back of my mind, especially since I did notably miss a chest or two. And then there's the whole cliffhanger thing. I kid you not, I was so hyped up for the game's conclusion, and then it dropped ending credits on me, and that was it. That was it. I was just mad. I am just going to, to die mad because of this. Because it told a genuinely neat story and then closed the door on it. And yeah, I, I guess that's the thing. They Always Run is a competent title, but the fact that it leaves me with such mixed feelings is why I ultimately have to rate it a fumble. I definitely think that fans of the action-adventure genre are likely going to get something out of it, especially if you want a neat story to dig into. Just prepare to get frustrated by the ending and by the lack of conclusion, that's all. At least I can give it credit though for having bindable controls with keyboard, mouse, and controller. Anywho, Thanks for tuning in. If you agree, disagree, or just have something to say to me, whether it's about this video or the channel at large, feel free to comment. And if you enjoy my efforts to create new indie reviews, developer interviews, and gaming content at large, hit the subscribe button and the bell so you know there's a new release. For the Discord savvy folks, you can click the video description to find a link to my community, the Crit Hit Cauldron, and to my Patreons, so you can support me and the other member of Crit Hit, my good editor, Hop. That said, I'll catch you on the next episode of Crit Hit. Take care till then, folks.